Today we're going to talk about conducted emissions measurement, um, part of your normal EMC test requirement. Uh, so this is one of the easier ones to do. Uh, the objective obviously to measure the emissions that are coming from your equipment. Um, but it wants to be done in a controlled and repeatable way as per your required standard. And the, the output at the end, um, obviously whatever debug is required and hopefully to generate a report to show the product meets the um, meets the required standard. So typically we'll be using a 50 ohm instrument, whether that be an EMC receiver, spectrum analyzer or the 50 ohm. 50 ohm input on your scope and we can't obviously directly connect that to 240 volt mains um, or our, our instrument is going to go bang. So the connection is made via a LISN and internally in the LISN we have essentially a high pass filter. So that's going to filter out our 240 volt 50 hertz and just pass the RF elements that we want to measure. Typically in the either 9 kilohertz or 150 kilohertz up to 30 megahertz range. Um, the next problem we have, which is also addressed by the LISN, is the impedance of the AC main supply. If you think about this, we're measuring um, the voltage coming from our equipment under test on here, but the emissions current is actually flowing back into the mains. The, the mains is the, the load for our emissions. So if this is a, an unknown, uncontrolled impedance, then obviously that's going to affect the voltage we see here. And the, your main supply in the frequency range we're looking at can range from uh, a few hundred ohms, um, well, actually from a few, a few ohms through to a few hundred ohms, and completely dependent on the, the mains infrastructure in the building, um, where the transformer is, how long the cables are, complete variability. So obviously, if we want to make repeatable measurements, we need to control this impedance. So that is done with, uh, again, an LC filter, effectively. Um, so that gives us a, a known controlled impedance uh, and will act as the load for our uh, emissions current. Uh, it also provides a certain amount of um, low pass filtering. So we just get the mains coming through here and not any RF components that happen to be on the main supply. Uh, the, the actual list is a little more complicated than this. this is sort of a, a simplified diagram, but that's effectively what's in there. And we have a controlled impedance and a AC coupled filter for our output. And the, the values of these components will be defined in the standard you're testing to. Um, so this would probably be the most common setup that we're looking at at the moment. Um, if you're familiar with the standards, we need to test both the live and neutral. So it's actually a bipolar config where you'll have the same on your, your live and neutral connections and then a switch to select which, which line you're testing. Um, whichever line is not being tested has a, an internal 50 ohm load attached to it because the, the 50 ohm in your instrument actually forms part of this network. So to keep everything consistent, there'll be a 50 ohm switched in. Um, when you toggle the uh, output. Now if we look at a commercial LISN, um, you also have a, a transient limiter on the output. So that is when you are switching between live and neutral, we can cause big spikes, which could potentially damage the instrument. Or if there's a, a large change on the, the mains, say you know, someone switches in a, a highly inductive load, um, that can cause big spikes that could potentially damage our sensitive instrument. So typically you have a, a transient limiter which also introduces a amount of loss. So there's a 10 dB loss would be fairly typical. Now if we look at a, a real LISN, so here's the Roden Swartz HM6050, a relatively low cost box. Um, so that includes the transient limiter over here with a, a button to disable it, which obviously has to be used with caution. Um, there's also artificial hand output for handheld devices and we have a selectable earth network as well, um, probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about here today, but for certain standards you need to effectively lengthen the earth connection, which is what that button does. And then we have the selector here between live and neutral. And when we toggle that you'll hear all the relays switching in, switching in that external or internal 50 ohm load.
The other point to note here, the main socket looks to be upside down. And we'll see in the next slide there's a, a good reason for that. So your, your typical setup, the lizen should be on the floor, bolted to a conductive ground plane. Should also be a ref vertical reference plane on the wall and a non-conductive, you know, probably wooden table that your device under test sits on. And all of this will be defined in the standard you're testing to. So this would be a fairly typical test setup, but you should really refer to the, the standard you're working to to make sure you're, you're doing it as they intended to get repeatable results. So that's basically it. Um, we have our, our lizard installed, bolted down to the ground. We've got our ground planes installed. We've got a, a nice space away from any um, RF sources, and we can test now in a repeatable, controlled way. Just a matter of taking this output to our 50 ohm test equipment. Now, that could be um, as simple as an oscilloscope with a, a good FFT, or a low cost spectrum analyzer, or an EMC receiver. For fully compliant measurements, or as close as you're going to get to compliant measurements in a lab, it should really be an EMC receiver. That will have pre-selectors and will do quasi-peak measurement, do it with the right uh, resolution bandwidth and receiver um, or to detectors as defined by the standard. Um, but you can still get a, a representative test just with a scope FFT for, for debug. So we're, we're going to carry on now and uh, show you the various instruments that could be used to make this measurement um, just for a, a quick show and tell and talk about some of the pros and cons of each. Okay so here's our LISN setup uh, so the HM6050 um, as you can see I've cut a few corners ideally the LISN should be on a, a ground plane we should have a wooden table on top of it but just to let you see what all is happening here and, and we'll still get representative results. For our device to test, I have this little uh, DC power supply. Um, there's a, a bit of a clue that it gives off NASIs as there is a, there's an inductor in its uh, mains lead. Kind of a, obviously they did some, got creative to get that through EMC. Um, so we have just taken the output from the LISN into our oscilloscope. Um, I've set this up for a 100 megahertz bandwidth limit because obviously we don't need more, there's no point adding more noise. And I've set my FFT up for a 30 megahertz span. So that's going from kind of DC through to 30 megahertz. And we can see this interesting looking um, profile coming off our power supply. So if I unplug the supply, we can see we've got nothing. So that's all conducted back off this. So obviously for, for debug use, we could obviously we could save a reference trace of that and then work to minimize what nastiness we're getting off our, our power supply. Um, so obviously cheap, effectively free, because every lab's going to have a scope around on it. Um, uh, the, depending on the scope you have, the FFT may not be as nice as this one. Um, these, these are particularly good on the FFT. And we can add additional traces for uh, max hold, min hold, etc. and save references. So there's actually a lot of debug we could do just with this on the scope. Um, what we are missing though is obviously our, our limit line. Because uh, it, it's not straightforward, it's not straight right across. It, uh, it, the, the limit changes depending on the frequency. And we're not measuring with the appropriate um, CISPR defined resolution bandwidth and detectors. So we're, we're seeing something coming off it and you know ideally we want nothing off our product. So this, this would be fine for debug use, but not to get a, a compliance measurement to say yes, that definitely meets the standard. But does the job as a, a quick debug. Okay, so I've swapped our oscilloscope for an FPC 1500 um, low cost spectrum analyzer. Um, we'll say we're getting very similar results. In this case, I've got a max hold trace on, so we can, can see the profile. Um, really very little to choose between this and the um, oscilloscope setup. Um, here I have the benefit of an internal preamp, um, which I've enabled, so it improves our noise floor and helps reduce the impact of our transient limiter. Um, but really, there's there's very little to choose from between the two. Um, both are giving us a, 
a quick responsive display, something we could use for debug your work. Um, yeah, it is what it is. Um, this box, the FPC 1500, can also work in receiver mode. And there's a bit of software from Roden Swartz lets us generate reports, set limit lines, etc., which is what we're going to show next. But for a basic spectrum analyzer, I mean, this could be any spectrum analyzer, and you're going to get you know, meaningful results. Okay, so now we have the, the same FPC uh, spectrum analyzer, but this time it's running in receiver mode. And we've, we've introduced a laptop running um, Electra software from Roden Swartz. Uh, so this is the same software that would be used with the, the high-end EMC receivers, but it does support this little low-cost FPC 1500. Um, for full automation, we can actually control the LISN as well. I haven't got it connected up, but it can uh, hook up the 232 cable. It could switch between live and neutral uh, and automate the whole process. Uh, so I'll, I'll spare you the details of the setup. There is, it is quite an involved setup, um, but obviously once it's configured, that's it. You're done. Um, so I have cheated slightly here. Normally, if we were doing this for real, we would use the quasi-peak um, detector to, um, to measure uh, as per CSPR, um, CISPR um, standard that we're, we're testing to. Um, but just for speed, I've set this onto uh, just a peak detector so it'll run through quickly. Um, so we configure all our tests. We tell it about any external attenuation, like the transient limiter, we tell what LISM we're using, um, tell it the test we want to test to, and basically just run from there. So that's now creating um, a specific instance of our test uh, based on a template. So that's brought in our limit line, and we're all set, ready to go. So if I just press run on that, Okay, that's now sending commands to the FPC to tell it to be a, a receiver. And it, it's prompting me here to switch the listen to neutral. That part could be automated, um, but we haven't bothered in this case, so it'll just prompt us. So if I just press OK on that. It's now going to use the receiver to um, step through our, our range. Um, it would normally be 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. And, and measure the output. Draw us a nice pretty graph. It's now asking me to switch to live. So just press the button. Okay, run again. As I say, the reason I've gone for a, for a peak detector here is just it's, it's much, much faster. If we were using the quasi peak, this test would take a, a significant amount of time. But it's just to give us, show you the flow of the software, how it would, would normally operate. Um, Again, with the, the automated software, normally if it was seeing um, peaks getting close to the limit, it would do further analysis on those. But it's saying here, no critical points found, uh, no final analysis needed. So, okay, we've got a, a clear pass. But obviously we, we kind of cheated to get that result. But just to give you an idea of the setup and, and, and how it would work. Um, obviously, for, if we're using the software, that would generate a nice, pretty report for us. Um, we would input at the start what equipment we're using, so the the serial number of the instruments, the, the LISN, the receiver, um, and that would all be documented. Um, so yeah, it makes your documentation easy and it does give you um, probably as close as you're going to get to a full conformance setup. Um, but if you're using this in the, the quasi-peak mode, it is slow. Um, just by the nature of quasi-peak measurement, it's it has to be slow. Um, so there you go. Um, Personally, I would probably use just the, the spectrum analyzer for debug type work uh, that you get a, a fast update and then use the um, the receiver mode to get your, your kind of final um, sort of confidence level that it is going to pass and get you a nice pretty report. There you go. Hope that's helped explain some of the basics.